speaker uh, of the morning, Dr. Jefferson. Hey, good morning. And uh, it's a great honor to give the last presentation of 2021. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about lupus nephritis this morning. Um, and just before I do, um, I just came across this actually really cool uh, paper that maybe some people have seen. Um, obviously, there's been big advances in molecular biology, um, single cell RNA seq, and other things. But I thought this was really cool. This is an example of imaging glomeruli by CT scan. So, this is using hierarchical phase contrast CT, something called a fourth generation synchrotron ultra bright beam light. Sounds uh, like something from Star Trek. Um, but what we can see here is just higher and higher resolution. And so in the CT scan, they can actually see individual glomeruli. And I think here that might be the efferent arterial, but really incredible sort of the advances that we're seeing in, uh, in imaging. Um, there is a video that goes with it, but uh, just for time purposes, we, we won't show that, but it, it's, uh, I thought this was pretty cool. So I thought I'd just kick off with this as, uh, as something that uh, I found interesting in my, in my reading recently. So moving on to lupus nephritis. So um, we're aware that uh, lupus nephritis occurs commonly in lupus, something like 40 to 50% of subjects develop lupus nephritis. And in this cohort uh, called the SLIC cohort, this is a group of kind of specialized lupus clinics around the world. Um, we know that even with this expert care, um, end-stage renal disease is still common in this uh, group of patients. And as we know, these are typically young women. So about 10% of 10 years, and there's also a high mortality, somewhere around 6% of 10 years in this, in this group of patients. So clearly, even with the best care, um, we still have a long way to go with the treatment of lupus nephritis. So I, I really want to sort of show this slide early, and this is really the kind of conclusion slide, but this is, uh, this is sort of where we are currently. So these are the KDIGO guidelines that were just published recently in Kidney International. And this is the algorithm for people who have proliferative glomerulonephritis. So here, class three or four, plus or minus class five. And so going down this algorithm, we see that an initial step is assessing the activity or chronicity on the kidney biopsy. Uh, if we have active disease, then we think about steroids. And KDGO now gives us four different options for induction therapy. So we have uh, a combination of, cal of calcineurin inhibitors and mycophenolate, either voclosporin or tacrolimus. We can have mycophenolate uh, plus steroid alone. We can have cyclophosphamide plus steroid, either the urolupus um, uh, regimen or NIH or even oral cyclophosphamide. Or we have uh, the use of belimumab with either mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about some of these options, but clearly we now have a lot of different ways to consider induction therapy for lupus nephritis. Now, one key here is to assess the activity um, of the patient when we get the diagnosis. So activity in the kidney biopsy um, is, uh, is assessed using uh, these criteria. And sometimes we'll actually get now a modified NIH activity index, which is which is scored in a zero to 24 scale. But these are the things that uh, when you get a path report, uh, you'll be looking for endocapillary hypercellularity, neutrophils or cariorexis, necrosis, crescents, wire loops or hyaline thrombi, and interstitial inflammation. All giving you an idea of the degree of activity. Now, obviously, we can't biopsy patients repeatedly, or it's certainly difficult to do that. So there's a lot of interest in non-invasive biomarkers of activity. And so here's one that I think we first came across uh, in ankylosing vasculitis. And now there are similar studies in lupus nephritis looking at urinary soluble CD163. So CD163 is a scavenger receptor on macrophages, and in particular, these M2 forms of macrophages. And these are the anti-inflammatory ones, but these are found to be, uh, on, on biopsy studies, found to be infiltrating the kidney in active lupus nephritis. So this, this marker can be cleaved to form the soluble CD, CD163, and then this can be found in the urine. And so studies, this is one study, there are several studies now looking at this, 
You can see here some correlation with urinary soluble CD163 with activity on the kidney biopsy. There is some correlation with treatment course, so increases with flares. As you get response, it decreases, tends to stay elevated in those who don't respond. And in this study, there seemed to be a better correlation with activity with, uh, with this biomarker than there is with proteinuria, one of our standard biomarkers. Now, obviously, this is a single uh, biomarker, um, and there's obviously a lot of work in this area. Um, so this is a consortium approach to this. Um, this is very similar, I think, to Neptune or to KPMP that uh, Jonathan talked about last week. Um, this is one of the uh, NIH partnerships with uh, Pharma um, and with, with some of the nonprofits, the Accelerating Medicines Partnership. So there are several of these in different diseases. This is the one in the sort of autoimmune rheumatoid arthritis and SLE. Um, and again, is to, is to sort of correlate uh, clinical, longitudinal clinical data with biosamples, collecting blood, urine for different omics, getting a, t a kidney biopsy and doing uh, sort of transcriptomics and different tissue analysis, digitalized pathology. Um, again, with the aim of, of identifying uh, disease subtypes, uh, different biomarkers, uh, biological pathways, signaling networks, etc. Um, and here's just one example uh, of this. This is an early study, a relatively small number of, of patients. So this is looking at greater than a thousand proteins in, in the urine of patients with lupus nephritis. And here's the typical volcano plot. What we see is that, that these proteins are increased in the urine compared to control. Um, and these uh, proteins are decreased uh, in the urine. And what we can see is the three uh, most notable increases are in IL-16, TGF-beta-1, and here's our friend CD-163. And then when they looked at these and compared these with, uh, with the tissue, they found actually pretty good correlation between urinary levels and, uh, and activity on the kidney biopsy. So um, urinary uh, soluble CD163 seems promising as a single biomarker, um, but obviously it's, uh, it's not too hard to see the future where we're going to have a panel of, uh, of biomarkers, which hopefully will give us uh, a more accurate assessment of how active the lupus nephritis is in the kidney without having to do repeated biopsies for these patients. So moving on, so let's think about uh, treatment options. I've got 2022 here, a little ambitious. We've still got a couple of weeks left, but I think this is where, where we currently are. Um, and before we talk about immunosuppression, I really want to emphasize this slide. Um, you know, when we see patients in clinic with, uh, with lupus nephritis, you know, our assessment and plan is very long. And the reason it's very long is because of the importance of all these different factors. Um, so uh, it's important to think about kidney protection, uh, blood pressure control, RAS blockade, cardiovascular risk protection. So the patients are going to be on multiple, multiple medications. And, and this is obviously a big issue because adherence is often a concern in these young patients. We need to think about infection risk, sort of screening for infections before we immunosuppress them, prophylaxis for uh, PJP. Uh, we need to think about bone health with the use of steroids. Um, these are young women, so we need to think about uh, fertility, um, contraception and pregnancy. Um, and in the case of cyclophosphamide or other immunosuppressive agents, we need to think about long-term cancer risk as well. So a lot goes into the management of these patients before we actually even consider immunosuppression. Um, and not quite in the immunosuppression scale, um, but maybe immunomodulatory scale, a hydroxychloroquine. So a medication that's widely used in lupus. Um, as we know, it has kind of a range of mechanisms. Um, it's antithrombotic, anti-inflammatory, but more specifically, it inhibits um, uh, toll-like receptor signaling within antigen-presenting cells, particularly dendritic cells. So decreasing the production of uh, interferon alpha, some other cytokines. And then the second process that we think about is increasing the pH in lysosomes in different cells. Uh, this interferes with uh, lysosomal action and proteolysis and decrease antigen presentation. So hydroxychloroquine kind of has a, has a wide range of mechanisms. Um, it's kind of used in almost all patients now with lupus. And specifically from the kidney point of view, 
there's now pretty good evidence that it actually protects the patients from kidney disease. So these are two cohorts. So the gladal cohort is, is a Latin American cohort, somewhere around 1,200 patients. And, and we can see that there's quite a, a marked decrease in the incidence of lupus nephritis in these patients with, um, uh, with lupus um, who are taking hydroxychloroquine compared to those who don't. And similarly in the Spanish cohort, again, protection against, against uh, the development of lupus nephritis. Those who do develop kidney disease have a decreased incidence of end-stage renal disease when they're on hydro hydroxychloroquine and actually an increased um, uh, odds ratio of having a complete response to therapy. So again, background therapy, we need to think about hydroxychloroquine for almost all patients. Um, typical dose is five milligrams per kilogram. And I think as we're all aware, there's a risk of retinal toxicity. So we need to have a monitoring strategy in sight. Uh, or in place for uh, monitoring these patients. Okay, so moving on to steroids. Um, so I think just to summarize this, that there's, there's as in ankyovasculitis, there's now a trend to use lower dose regimes uh, of steroids. So there are multiple small studies using lower dose steroids, um, still frequently giving uh, methylprednisone up front but with lower doses and faster, taper, faster tapering. Here's one small study from the UK that actually didn't give any maintenance uh, steroid, just give pulses of methylprednisone and combined rituximab and mycophenolate. And this small group actually did very well. Um, this is kind of typical AMS data for, or AMS dosing for um, glucocorticoids. Um, and this is kind of a more, more uh, where the field is moving using these lower doses of steroids. Um, and this is a nice study here that sort of reviews the effects of steroids, the side effects and the dosing in, uh, in uh, people who get steroids in lupus nephritis. So just the summary from this, um, again from KDigo, um, their practice point suggests a reduced dose of glucocorticoids following a short course of methylprednisone pulses may be considered. So clearly not a very strong uh, recommendation, um, but many in many patients, we can think about using this reduced dose of steroids. Here is the reduced dose scheme they recommend. Um, well, I guess in all these regimes, you can now see a lower dose of pulsed methylprednisone, kind of 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, rather than you know, the one gram three times a day that we used to use. This is kind of an ALMS uh, standard dose of steroids, and you can see at about three months, they're only getting down to 15 milligrams a day, starting off at 60 to uh, 80 milligrams a day. And in this reduced dose, uh, we're looking at starting at somewhere around 30, maybe 40 milligrams a day, and really tapering quite quickly. So by three months, down to five milligrams, and after three months, using this 2.5 um, um, uh, maintenance level of, uh, of prednisone equivalent. Okay, so um, calcineurin inhibitors. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be moving through uh, all this data pretty fast. Uh, so, uh, an important thing about calcineurin inhibitors is the is the mechanism of action for reducing proteinuria, uh, and this is a key point because proteinuria is a major component of the composite endpoints that are used in all of the lupus nephritis studies. And certainly it's important to reduce proteinuria because in lupus proteinuria seems to be the most important predictor of long-term outcome uh, for, uh, for the patients. So we know that the sort of canonical pathway is the inhibition of T-cell activation. So calcineurin uh, uh, dephosphorylates, the nuclear factor of activated transcription, which decreases IL-2 production and activation of T-cells. So that's kind of what we, we think about as our standard uh, effect of calcineurin inhibitors. It's important to realize that calcineurin inhibitors also have direct podocyte effects. So lots of medications have been shown to have direct podocyte effects, but um, calcineurin inhibitors uh, also de dephosphor or inhibit the dephosphorylation of synaptopodin, which leads to stabilization of the actin cytoskeleton. And then we're aware of the hemodynamic effects of calcineurin inhibitors with uh, leading to vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. 
So this is the original multi-target uh, therapy study. So um, this was a uh, um, multi-target therapy with prednisone, mycophenolate, and tacrolimus. So originally this was a study from China, a multi-center study looking at 368 patients. And just to point out the, uh, the primary endpoint was complete remission, proteinuria less than 0.4 grams per 24 hours, an inactive urine sediment, and essentially a normal serum creatinine. And what I want to point out is that this number varies quite a lot amongst the different studies. And it's actually quite difficult to compare the percentages in one study versus another because of these different endpoints that have been chosen in the different studies. So the background therapy in the multi-target study was, uh, I would say, moderate dose steroids. So 500 milligrams times three methylprednisone followed by 0.6 milligrams per kilogram for four weeks, tapering down by five milligrams a week, but to a maintenance of 10 milligrams. So these patients stayed on a 10 milligram maintenance. And the multi-target was low dose mycophenolate at 0.5 milligrams BID um, and tacrolimus two milligrams BID, uh, aiming for targets kind of in the five to seven range versus an NIH protocol cyclophosphamide. So six monthly doses of cyclophosphamide. And the bottom line was um, that in the uh, multi-target group compared to the cyclophosphamide group, and so the blue lines here or the blue bars are complete remission rates. And we can see at six months, we 45% achieved complete remission in the multi-target group compared to 26.5% in the cyclophosphamide group. And then an extension study for 18 months showed that these, these rates of complete remission were maintained and in fact actually improved. And you can see by 18 months, the cyclophosphamide group actually, uh, actually caught up. So this was a, a group of uh, a study done in Chinese subjects um, who actually uh, achieved really very good results with, uh, with multi-target therapy. So moving on to voclosporin. So this is kind of the new kid on the block. So voclosporin is, uh, is a new calcineurin uh, inhibitor. It's a structurally modified cyclosporin molecule. So here is the cyclosporin molecule. And here is the modification. So essentially, it's a kind of a carbon ex extension with a double bond uh, onto the uh, cyclosporin molecule. And this significantly changed the, uh, the pharmacokinetics of, uh, of this new calcineurin inhibitor, um, such that it's felt that weight-based dosing and trough levels are not required for the use of this. So this makes this um, a friendly uh, calcineurin inhibitor to use. Um, it also seemed to change the metabolic side effects of, uh, of cyclosporin and, uh, or compared to other calcineurin inhibitors. Um, less effect on lipid profiles, less risk of diabetes in some studies, and also does not interfere with mycophenolate the way cyclosporin does. Obviously, one caveat is the expense of a, of a new medication. Um, I looked up GoodRx yesterday, and from what I can tell, a 12-month course of octosporin will cost approximately $144,000 a year. Whereas um, a year of tacrolimus at kind of similar doses uh, is going to cost about $1,000. So clearly a big difference in cost. So what is the data? So there was a phase two study, but this is the phase three study now, which is called Aurora or Aurora 1. So these patients had active lupus nephritis. They had an EGFR greater than 45 and proteinuria greater than 1.5 grams per gram. So the background therapy that they got was mycophenolate plus steroids. And it's important to note that the, that the mycophenolate dose was two grams a day, not three grams. And they got low dose oral steroids. And this was both in the voclosporin and in the control group. Now, it's important to look at the steroids a little bit more closely as well. Um, the steroid induction dose for methylprednisone was 500 milligrams times two doses. And then they used a very low steroid dose. Um, so um, the initial dose was kind of in the 20 to 25 milligrams a day for uh, two weeks, then dropping down to 15 to 20. At four weeks, dropping down to 10 to 15. By three months, down to five milligrams, and then maintenance 2.5. So you can see this is, uh, this is much lower than, than we typically use in lupus. 
Um, but looking even at the placebo group, when we see the results, these, the results were very similar to uh, overall to ALMS data, suggesting that, that this uh, may be an appropriate uh, dosing strategy for at least some people with, uh, with lupus nephritis. The reason I say for some people with lupus nephritis is looking at the baseline characteristics of this study, and again, with most, study, with most studies of lupus nephritis, these are all relatively mildly affected patients compared to what we often see in clinic. So the baseline EGFR, the mean was 92 or 90 in these two groups. 82% of patients or 80% of patients had an EGFR greater than 60. Clearly there was significant proteinuria around four grams a day. And then looking at the split uh, of pathology about uh, Eighty-five percent or so had proliferative disease. Fifteen percent had uh, pure lupus membranous. And then looking at the biomarkers again, the mean baseline C three was eighty-two compared to eighty-seven. So again, a modest drop, and only about fifty percent of patients had C threes less than ninety, and about a quarter had C fours less than ten. But here are the results, which looked uh, quite exciting. So, uh, so what they saw in the voctosporin group was a significant uh, increase in the complete remission rate. Uh, so the complete, uh, um, sorry, com complete, uh, I can't remember what CR stands for, complete renal remission rate, renal rate, the, the CR, but it's a composite endpoint of four uh, different points. So. Um, the important thing is the urine protein creatinine ratio was less than 0 0.5 grams per gram. And then with a stable GFR, no rescue therapy, and no uh, and, and ensuring they were on low-dose steroids. And if we look at the at the uh, at the partial renal re, uh, relapse rate, not relapse rate, the partial renal, I've forgotten what the RR stands for. Um, but in uh, the PRR, um, Again, week 24, about 70% of patients dropped their uh, protein creatinine ratio by 50%, and that was maintained at, uh, at 52 weeks. So overall, um, overall good results um, and, uh, and achieving this low urine protein creatinine ratio. And then just data that's not published yet, but has just come out uh, sort of uh, uh, online um, is the extension study. This is Aurora 2. So that this, this data is a one-year uh, data. So this is the 18 months extension. And what they saw was, you know, and this is this is urine protein creatinine ratio. So a fairly rapid drop in urinary uh, PCR, which was maintained over the 30 months of the study. There's obviously a concern with calcineurin inhibitors and, uh, and nephrotoxicity. Um, but again, what we saw is relatively stable renal function um, over the 30-month period. Again, these are patients who are starting out with relatively good renal, uh, renal function. Um, here's some data on, uh, on safety in Aurora 2. Uh, what I would say is overall, um, the voclosporins seem to be pretty safe. Um, without going into details, there was a little bit of a signal for more hypertension um, in this group. And maybe a signal in some patients uh, they had a drop in uh, in EGFR. Um, now I was at a um, at a talk that Jerry Appel gave. Um, it was it was a, a, a company talk, um, and what he noted was that many of the patients in the study actually had a reduction in the dose of voclosporin. That doesn't really come out clearly that I could read in the studies. Um, but at that, at that uh, meeting, he said 70% of patients required a reduction in voclosporin because of a decrease in GFR. So I haven't seen that confirmed in writing anywhere, but, um, but certainly uh, that's something that we need to, to look out for. So take home points from Aurora. Um, voclosporin does reduce proteinuria, it reduces it rapidly versus placebo. Um, but these patients are still on voclosporin. This is not an induction therapy. This is more, almost kind of induction and maintenance. So there are different ways that voclosporin might reduce proteinuria. Um, immunological parameters didn't change much, uh, but as you remember, they were not greatly depressed at baseline. And there is some biopsy data to come uh, at, at two years. Um, they had a stable GFR, um, but voclosporin dose reduction was required. And notably, this was on a low-dose steroid protocol.
Okay, so moving uh, quickly on to B cell therapies. Um, I think we're familiar with the mechanism of action of these drugs. Um, this is the Lunar study of rituximab. This was a non-significant study. There was an 11% absolute difference, but numbers were relatively small. And certainly we've used rituximab pretty widely um, as rescue therapy in lupus and, and seems to work well in, in different cohort studies with that. Um, but one issue about, about Lunar was um, um, the number of patients who developed B-cell depletion. So this was a reanalysis of the data published in 2018. According to those people who developed, those subjects who developed B cell, complete B cell depletion versus not. And if you look at 70, at the 78 weeks, a year and a half time point, there was a significant difference in complete, complete response rates between those patients who depleted versus didn't. So this led us, uh, this and other things led to the nobility trial. Um, so this is a trial of a new um, anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody, obinutuzumab, which is a much more effective uh, B-cell depleter, both in the circulation and in the tissues. Now, this is a phase two study. The phase three study is ongoing, 123 patients. Notably, three quarters of the patients were Hispanic. Um, again, relatively normal kidney function going in, proteinuria around 3.2 grams. And the, these patients all had proliferative lupus nephritis. So the background standard of care, again, Michael Fenlate, and again, low-dose steroids. And they got a binatuzumab, 1,000 milligrams times two, and again, repeated at six months, similar to the lunar dosing. And what we can see here is they really achieved excellent B-cell depletion within a couple of weeks. And if we compare this to the rituximab data, so by week two, 96% of binatuzumab had depleted their B cells compared to 52%. In rituximab, this increased up to three months or so and then started to decrease again. Whereas no binatuzumab, it was maintained throughout the first year. And then only in the second year when there was no, no further obinutuzumab did the B cells recover. So this phase two trial, um, again, showed some promising results. Um, no difference in complete remission rates up to six months, but really uh, a separation of the curves at this stage and maybe continuing to separate as time goes on. So at the two year time point, 41% had achieved a complete renal response versus 23%. And then I know this is kind of hard to see, but lab parameters, this is kind of the delta in the lab parameters, C3, C4, double-stranded DNA, EGFR, but you can see in these in these kind of standard biomarkers, we're seeing an improvement in all of these biomarkers with the obinutuzumab. So I think a lot of excitement about uh, about this medication, and uh, we look forward to seeing the phase three results. Belimumab. So belimumab. Belimumab has been around for a long time. We think it's a new drug because it's relatively new to the kidney world, but this was FDA approved in March 2011. So it's been on the market for, for 10 years already. But this study was published in, in 2020. So this again is a study, sort of background therapy with either mycophenolate or cyclophosphamide. Um, and this used high-dose glucocorticoids. And then they were randomized to belimumab, um, it, Blimamab was given intravenously in this study, plus standard therapy versus placebo. And this was a, essentially a two-year study. The primary endpoint was at two years. And the primary endpoint was, um, was uh, used this um, uh, protein-creatinine ratio of 0 0.7. So again, a composite endpoint. Um, and the reason they used a higher urine protein-creatinine ratio was some data came out or some data has, has shown that um, looking at outcomes in the long term at lupus nephritis, you may not need to get the urine protein creatinine ratio down as low as 0 0.5. Um, a couple of studies have shown this. So they use this higher um, urine protein creatinine ratio, but they also use this uh, more standard as a secondary endpoint using this, this composite value using the urine protein creatinine ratio of less than 0 0.5. So the results for, um, for this study, um, again, showing about an, roughly an 11% absolute difference. So at two years, 43% um, versus 32%, or if you use kind of the more standard and stricter criteria, complete remission rates of 30% versus 
And importantly, we did see a reduction in, um, in activity biomarkers. So we saw falls in double-stranded DNA and in C1Q and autoantibodies and a rise in C3 and C4 compared to placebo. I'm um, not going to say too much about safety, but essentially, um, despite enhancing the immunosuppression in this study, and again, this study still used relatively higher doses of steroids, there wasn't a big safety signal with, uh, with bilimumab. So take-home points from, um, from the Bliss Lupus Nephritis study. Um, the, uh, it was efficacious. There was reduced composite endpoints roughly by about 10% and also improved the immunological biomarkers versus placebo. Then secondary analysis published in, uh, in the paper this year by Brad Roven in Kidney International um, showed that there were decreased lupus flares, both systemic and renal. Um, they didn't see a difference in class four. So about 20, um, I think about 20% of the group had 15, 20% had class five lupus, again, a small number, but didn't see a difference uh, in this subgroup. Um, also didn't see a difference in the group that were induced with cyclophosphamide, and that was about a quarter of the group. Um, but we also know from earlier studies of, in, of uh, bliss in systemic lupus that it's effective in non-renal systemic disease. Um, just a couple of other points, or at least one point, is that only a third of these patients were taking rasplicate in this study, and, and that might certainly affect your uh, proteinuria endpoints. So, belimumab versus voclosporin, uh, clearly no easy answer to this. It's, it's great that we now have all these different uh, options we can use for different patients. Um, clearly, belimumab is intravenous, or there is a subcutaneous uh, auto-injector that patients can use at home, which... Uh, which the patients like. Um, it's effective, um, decreases systemic lupus symptoms and improves activity of biomarkers. Voclosporin is oral, um, gets an early and sustained proteinuria response and, and quite a, a markedly reduced steroid dosing regimen, which, which I think is quite exciting. Um, and I put bilimumab versus voclosporin, but I think you could also add tacrolimus here. So um, the difference between voclosporin and tacrolimus, I think is still, uh, is still a question mark. So one thing just to note is that all these studies were induction studies. Um, so none of them were rescue studies. So the question is, um, how do we, when we have a patient in front of us with lupus nephritis, how do we, uh, what's, what's the initial therapy that we choose for these patients? And I think that's, that's going to just depend on, on kind of the activity of the patient, how severe the disease is, um, whether they're relapsing and have had previous diseases, what their baseline kidney function is. Um, but one option that uh, has been described in this paper um, considered starting with steroids and mycophenolia, particularly in kind of the, uh, the patients that are seen in the studies, um, using low-dose steroids, following for two to three months, and then if having failure at this stage, as defined by not uh, finding a drop in proteinuria of greater than 25% or, or an unstable GFR, at that stage, considering adding bilimumab or voclosporin. Um, and again, just to emphasize, this is not, uh, has not been shown in the studies. The studies are all induction studies starting bilimumab or voclosporin um, at the time of microfilm. And then last slide, I realize it's been a bit of a rush. Um, there's a multitude of, of uh, new medications in the, pop, in the pipeline. And I just wanted to highlight this one, anafrolumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the interferon receptor type one. And this is FDA approved just, uh, just this year for the treatment of systemic lupus. And the lupus nephritis study is, is underway. So we're interested to see the uh, effects of this medication. So uh, thanks for listening and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ashley. I certainly learned a lot. There's been some discussion in the chat amongst our other glomerular disease experts. Um, any questions for Ashley? Perhaps I will ask a question while other people are thinking. Um, how will you feel about the monoclonal antibody that I can't pronounce, it starts with an O, uh, that has been studied? Um, I mean, is it concerning to you that you'd have complete B-cell depletion for potentially years in the current uh, 
era of COVID and data that supports concerns with rituximab, for example, in, in patients uh, who get COVID. I'm just curious what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, so I, I'm concerned about rituximab in the COVID era. Uh, and in fact, I don't give it to, to my patients unless they're vaccinated. Um, I had a patient yesterday who I refused to give him rituximab for his relapsing minimal change disease. And he came back in yesterday because he developed COVID which stimulated a relapse in his minimal change disease it was kind of ironic, um, but at least he's feeling well and bad things did not, or super bad things did not happen to him. So obinutuzumab, I think is, is a more potent rituximab is the bottom line. So the concerns you have with rituximab, you can increase. Um, now once obinutuzumab was stopped, um, then over the next year, the B cells did repopulate. So by two years, um, only 16% of patients still had uh, B cell depletion. So they do repopulate, but it takes longer. Other questions for Ashley? Can I ask a question, Doc? Uh, sure. sure. You might oh, just, um, you know, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Dr. Sandy Esteban. I'm down in San Francisco. Uh, I used to be at UC, but I'm in private practice down here. Oh, I don't and, uh, anyhow, you mentioned the one study where they only used a third pa the patients at RAS inhibitors, and I was wondering why. And two, would you consider in your patients that somebody who had like angioedema and couldn't take an ACE, have you seen or any talks about using renin inhibitors to lower their proteinuria? Um, so th the first question, um, so it was not part of the inclusion criteria that they were mandated to be on um, an ACE inhibitor for the Bliss Lupus Nephritis study. And then once they had entered the study, they were kind of locked in. They were not allowed to start RAS blockade after that because that would alter the endpoint. So clearly that's not a kind of a real world situation, but that's, that's what was used in, in the study. Okay. Um, for uh, angioedema and ACE inhibitors, then you know my next line is typically to try switching to a rat to an angiotensin receptor blocker. Um, there is sometimes a little bit of cross um, reaction, but it's it's pretty small. Um, I use renin inhibitors pretty infrequently, uh, but you know I think that would be an option. I probably use spironolactone more commonly rather than than renin inhibitors in that situation. Thank you. All right. I guess we'll take the rest of the discussion offline. Thanks everyone and thanks Ashley. Um, and hope everyone has a, a happy holiday season and we will see everyone back uh, in the new year. Thanks everybody. <laughs>